morning and welcome. Welcome to our new students, our Connections students, our returning faculty, staff, and friends. Wherever you came from, however you came to be in this place, you are welcome here. Welcome to the first chapel of the fall semester. As we go forth into a new semester, we also enter into a new fall preaching series. This semester's series is titled, Are We the Religious Right? Discerning Caesar's Due in Today's Jeopardies of Justice. Throughout the semester, our faculty, staff, students, and alumni will be wrestling with scripture texts related to the idea of justice as we continue to discern together where God is calling us to do good work and ministry in today's world. Today we welcome to the pulpit we and Professor of New Testament Studies, Dan Ulrich. As many of you already know, and those of you new to Bethany will soon discover, Dan brings his passion for scripture to both his classes and the pulpit. So I am grateful to have Dan starting us off today to guide us through a challenging text. Welcome, Dan. Some words of instruction before we begin. For those new to the seminary, you will note in your bulletin that the first hymn is located in the hymnal supplement, which is the thinner blue book in the pews. We will sing that hymn through three times, and then the other hymn is located in the regular hymnal, which is the thicker blue book. Sisters and brothers and friends, will you please rise in body or in spirit and let us worship together. We have come from near and from far across oceans and rivers and internet, from different cultures and continents. We have come to worship and to learn, to sow and to reap, to grow and to discern as the body of Christ, as disciples of the Holy Spirit, as the people of God. Amen.
God of justice and of mercy, in challenging times when justice and equality seem sparse and anger and fear runs rampant, we look to you for the wisdom, the patience, and the persistence to be in the world, but of you. Guide us in your will and teach us in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the book of Matthew. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Students have asked us to speak about jeopardies of justice and what it is to seek justice in the public square rooted in Christian faith. I've been weeping at the news lately. I've been weeping at the overt racism and also at the covert racism that like hurricanes destroys lives, separates people, drowns us in injustice. And so this is a sermon where I feel challenged and where I feel called to challenge us. And in that process of feeling challenged, I felt led to a text that has bothered me for a long time. It, it's this is a text that does not appear in any current lectionary. No student in my exegesis course has ever chosen to focus on it for a semester. When I mentioned it to Karen as a possibility, she seemed very dubious. Yet here it is in the midst of Matthew, passionately warning us about the danger of failing to repent. This warning comes in the midst of a sharp conflict in Matthew's story. Jesus is in conflict with the leaders of his people. In fact, they're already plotting to kill him, according to Matthew 12, 14, even before the Pharisees ask for him for a sign. Jesus has been challenging their authority by emphasizing mercy over sacrifice, by healing on the Sabbath by forgiving people they think should not be forgiven. He is creating enemies with his stand for God's reign and its justice. 
And he's in conflict not only with the leaders of his people, but with the crowds. They have flocked to him for healing. They have had their demons removed. But they haven't done what he most wants. His message is, repent, for the reign of heaven is at hand. That's why he's healing, to demonstrate in visible form the reign of God. He has mercy, and that mercy is the heart of God's reign the foundation of justice. But it takes repentance to live in that mercy and in that justice. And he's not seeing it among the crowds. That's why he warns them earlier in chapter 11. Repentance for the kingdom of heaven as it is at hand. Repent and turn away from evil, turn toward the good, repent and seek the justice of God's reign. We often translate dikaiosune as righteousness, but it's not just an internal quality of moral goodness, much less a holier-than-thou attitude. Righteousness means justice. It has social dimensions. It has to do with the way we live in society, the way we treat one another. Do all people receive equal opportunities? Are all people valued as God values each one of us? This is justice. This is a heart of the reign of God. What we are called to seek above all else because we are followers of Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus wants all people to have healing. That's why when they're sick, he cures them all in Matthew. Jesus wants all people to have enough food. That's why he feeds the multitudes. Jesus wants people to have rest from their labors. That's why he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. This is justice in God's reign. This is the good that Jesus seeks and unfortunately, unfortunately, the people in Jesus' generation have not gotten on board. He will give them a sign far greater than the sign of Jonah when he appears risen from the dead. And yet even then, the leaders in Matthew's story do not repent. His wisdom is far greater than the wisdom of Solomon. And yet, people have not listened enough to seek first the reign of God. In these comparisons, Jesus kept seeing, keeps saying that something is greater than Jonah and, and Solomon. Something, not someone, something. What is greater? It is the reign of God that Jesus embodies, that Jesus makes visible, the reign of God that we are to seek above all else. Jesus' warning continues with a parable about a relapse. Someone has been cured of demonic possession, liberated from an unclean spirit that dominated that person's life, and, and that's a good thing, but sadly it's not permanent. The, the demon seeks to return and comes back and finds that person like an empty house all clean and swept, like my office occasionally gets. But like my office, it's not permanent. The mess comes back. The demon comes back seven times worse. And the consequences are tragic. Jesus knows that opposition to evil is not enough. We have to replace it with something. We have to replace it with the justice and the goodness and the love of God's reign. Just driving out evil doesn't stop it. You have to seek the good. As far as I know, I've never encountered any literal demons. But I have seen plenty of demonic forces at work in our world. Here's another example. Dr. Anna Haddock uh, is a member of the Oakland Church of the Brethren. And she is on the front lines of dealing with the opioid epidemic in Ohio. 
She says that she can help patients withdraw from opioids by using a drug that blocks the effect of the drugs. The narcotic effect is gone. The desires are gone as long as that drug is in, is in use. But eventually, it becomes time to withdraw even from the treatment and to make one's way without drug help. And that's the most dangerous time. When active medical treatment is gone, people are tempted to return and get high again. And if they return to the same dose they were using when they had developed resistance to the drug earlier, now they no longer have that resistance, it can be fatal. So it is, Jesus says. I think he has discovered a similar, similar dynamic in his own work as a doctor, his own work with those who are tormented by evil. I can imagine him warning, you are free for now, but freedom will not last. Freedom will not last unless you fill that empty space with the love and justice and mercy of God. Jesus understands that opposition to evil is not enough. You have to replace it with good. At the turn of the 20th century, a Spanish reformer by the name of Joaquin Costa came up with a slogan that summarized his hope for replacing evil with good in his Spanish society. In Spanish it goes, Escuela, despensa, y siete llaves al sepulcro del, el, del Cid. Translated, what Spain needs are schools, a pantry, and seven locks on the tomb of El Cid. Diego, Die, Rodrigo Diego de Vivar was known as the Cid. He was the legendary hero who in the 11th century fought to reconquer Spain from its Muslim rulers. An epic poem celebrates El Cid's courage, chivalry, and amazing military success. But Joaquin Costa viewed that story from a different historical perspective. Costa saw Spain repeatedly wasting its resources on wars against so-called infidels around the world when too many people lacked basic necessities like education and food. Too many of Spain's leaders were trying to be the next El Cid instead of working to improve the society with education and economic reforms to have a school and a pantry you needed to keep El Cid's ghost locked up. Now if I were to translate Costa's slogan for my cultural context it would go something like this. What the United States needs are better schools, community gardens, and seven locks on the tomb of Turner Ashby. Now, for those of you who are not natives of the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, as I am, let me explain. During the American Civil War, Turner Ashby was a Confederate cavalry commander under General Stonewall Jackson. He was nicknamed the Knight of the Valley. He was legendary not only for his quick, unpredictable attacks against larger Union forces, but also for his chivalry and for the stunning good looks that made many a lady swoon. When he died in battle near Harrisonburg, Virginia in June 1862, he was charging toward the enemy on foot after his horse had been shot. He shouted his last words while waving his sword, and those words were, charge, men, for God's sake, charge. Ashby tried, died trying to keep Union troops from burning the whole valley. Never mind that he was also fighting to keep Virginia safe for slavery. Next month, the Turner Ashby High School class of 1977 will hold its 40th year reunion and I'm invited. If Paul and I are able to go, I expect to see the Turner Ashby Knights charge onto the football field. I will also look for chances to ask some old friends 
whether it might be time for our school to change its name. Turner Ashby High School got its name in 1956, just two years after the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed racial segregation in public schools. That's not a coincidence. By the time I attended, most whites had stopped resisting school integration, and racism and sexism were no longer an explicit part of the curriculum. In fact, my high school teacher and, history, and debate coach, I'm sorry, history teacher and debate coach, David Bottenfield, did his best to give us the critical skills that we needed to ch challenge racist and sexist narratives. Nevertheless, the co-curriculum had me singing after every touchdown that I would fight, fight with all my might for Turner Ashby High. I didn't even consider how my African-American classmates might feel about that name. Racism is a subtle and insidious demon, so subtle we may not even be aware when we're possessed by it. It takes up residence in our souls, giving us feelings of superiority, giving us feelings of fear that others might challenge that status. We can make progress getting rid of it, but we can never afford to think that the struggle is over. As a middle class white heterosexual male, I have had privileges all my life that have sometimes, I would say often, been the result of injustice against others. Too often, I have been silent in the face of injustice. Is that because I fear losing my privileges, much as the leaders in Matthew's story fear losing them, theirs? I would never spew hatred like the neo-Nazis neo did in Charlottesville recently, but does that fact make me free of racism? The neo-Nazis were using slogans that conjured up another racist demon, one even older than racism against African Americans, the demon of anti-Semitism. And as I read Jesus' sharp critique against the scribes and Pharisees, I might be tempted to distance myself from them. I might think, for example, that I am a Christian and they are Jews. What Jesus says is against those Jews. How convenient for me to distance myself from the religious leaders who are actually quite similar to my profession. How convenient for me to place on them the warning that Jesus speaks. And yet, that too stems from a demon, the demon of anti-Semitism. So let me resist that now by acknowledging my similarity to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew's story and my preference to distance myself from Jesus' call to repentance. Repentance means resisting evil where it appears, however insidious. It also means working for the good, the justice of God's reign. Resistance includes challenging, correcting ourselves and correcting others. Matthew 18.15 calls for private correction when we experience someone else's sinning. And certainly that should be happening when we experience examples of racism. And I hope that if I ever do something or say something that appears to be you to be racist or sexist or involved in any other kind of injustice, that you will come to me and let me know. I need that because I don't always know. That's how insidious it is. And now we are in a country where there are religious leaders calling themselves Christian who need to be challenged, not just privately but publicly challenged for their complicity in racism. Jesus warned about people like that. 
wolves in sheep's clothing, he called them. And let's be clear, we need to challenge it. I hope we challenge it humbly because no one is exempt. But we need to challenge it firmly. Sometimes faithfulness to God's reign and its justice means opposing the leaders of our own religious traditions and communities, just as Jesus did. Opposing evil is important, but it's not enough. I get at least a dozen emails a day asking me to contribute money to oppose Donald Trump. I yearn for emails that will spell out a positive vision for the good that we could do if we work together in this country. Both major parties are really good at opposing things, and I'm sorry, but really bad at spelling out positive visions. Where is the justice of God's reign? What can we work for that is good, that speaks of the best of our country? We need to work for that as well as oppose the evil. When Martin Luther King Jr. led the march on Washington, August 28, 1963, it wasn't billed as a march against racism. It was billed as a march for what? For jobs and freedom. What are we for? We need to be able to say that. And here is a challenge also for those of us who administer in Jesus' name. We need communities that are for justice and peace. Communities that are outposts of God's reign. Communities that work together with people of all faiths and traditions to better the community. When we do that, we're taking up the space that evil might otherwise occupy. When we do that, we have better schools, we have community gardens, we have robust democracy, we have what we need to keep Turner Ashby locked in his tomb. I'd like to close with a portion of a local TED talk recorded by a Bethany graduate, Martin Hutchinson. Martin pastors the Community of Joy Church of the Brethren in Salisbury, Maryland. It's a congregation that does a great deal to be of service in the community where they are located. And this video gives you one small example. Martin goes on to talk about uh, a goal of more community gardens. This video is intended to promote a movement, a movement to improve the city of Salisbury, Maryland, not just by growing veggies, but by engaging families, by bringing people together in a diverse project, or diverse people together in a project that benefits everyone. Vacant lots, like vacant houses, can be filled with good or evil. One of the best ways to oppose evil is to grow what is good. What good things does God want to grow in you, in your community? Justice and peace grow in God's reign, and that reign is still at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Amen.
You are blessed, O seekers of God's reign and its justice. Go forth knowing that Jesus is with you, empowering you to oppose evil and grow what is good. Share God's love and mercy with all you meet. As God loves everyone without discrimination, so too may you love all with a love that is wide and deep.